Alberta. Welcome to the first set of CUPS Issues and Impacts series for 2021. I'm really pleased to have everybody here today. I'm going to start with a little bit of housekeeping before we start our session. There are over 200 participants registered for today's session. And so in order to make sure that there are as few technological hiccups as possible, we're going to ask everybody to please keep yourself muted. And also, if you can, to please turn off your cameras so that there's, uh, we're not drawing as much uh, off the system. We're going to spotlight our speaker, Kathleen, during her talk. So you shouldn't have to make too many adjustments to your screens. This talk's going to be recorded. So of course, you'll be able to see her slides in that recording. And it will be available on the School of Public Health's YouTube channel, which we'll share with you in the chat box. And we'll also send that in our follow-up email through your Eventbrite registration. I'm going to take directly your questions from the chat box and I'll pose them to Kathleen at the end of our session today. Now I wanted to start our time together by recognizing and speaking to the land that we're meeting on today. I know there are people on our call that are from various geographical locations and some even internationally. And so our participants may reach across the traditional territories of many nations, indigenous nations. And honoring the land that we're on and the footsteps that have walked these lands before us grounds us and acknowledges the importance of relationships. So I want to acknowledge the land on which I'm standing and the wisdom and footsteps that have marked it for generations. And I encourage you to do the same. The place where I live and join you from today is acknowledged to be the territory covered by Treaty 6 and Region 4 of the Métis Nation of Alberta, a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and traveling route for many Indigenous peoples for centuries. And by acknowledging this territory, we respect the histories, languages, cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada that enrich our vibrant communities. A treaty is an inheritance a responsibility and a relationship. We are all treaty people, beneficiaries of the peace and prosperity the treaty brought and committed also to working towards the equity and justice that the treaty promised. May recognizing our status as treaty people help us to be good neighbors to one another, good stewards of the land and good ancestors to all our children. I know there are many people on the call today who do know who CUP is, but there's some who may not. So I'm going to take a very quick moment to describe to you who CUP is and about our series. CUP is a research center in the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. And for the past 20 years, CUP has worked closely with community organizations, researchers, practitioners, funders, and policymakers in Edmonton and across Alberta to identify issues of concern to the well being of children, youth, and families and communities. In response to those issues, we collaboratively create research and evaluation projects, generate evidence and mobilize it to improve practices, programs and policies. We have numerous community partners who have been on this journey with us for decades and we would not be who we are without them. This year CUP celebrating its 20th anniversary and as part of our celebration, we've developed the issues and impact series. The series is a way for CUP to celebrate, to bring attention and to discuss issues that are relevant and of concern to the current research partnerships we are engaged in. Each segment of the series engages field experts and local partnerships. Field experts speak to a current issue of concern like Kathleen will today, related to one of our research priority areas and our local partnerships will provide a more intimate discussion of the local projects we're working on to understand and achieve impacts on that same issue. In December, we had two talks focused on community-based participatory research. And from the issues, we talked about issues leveraging those types of research practices to advance system and policy changes for health and social justice. And our local partnership reflected on a long-term research partnership and how institutional and university policies impacted that project and partnerships. If you wish to see these talks, you can access them on the School of Public Health's YouTube channel. But today we kick off our second segment, which we're going to focus on early learning and care. And I am incredibly pleased to welcome our field expert today, Ms. Kathleen Flanagan. 
She's an international early childhood education and care policy consultant and researcher. Her work has specialized in strategic policy development for governments and national organizations that has resulted in successful implementation of innovative policy change. She works closely with the OECD's Education Secretariat as a member of the expert team in South Korea for the International Thematic Review of Early Childhood Education and Care. In Canada, she has co-led several national initiatives focused on human resources in the ECEC sector and is Secretariat to the Provincial Territorial Directors of Early Childhood Education and Care. She's provided expertise in curriculum development, including the development of a national kindergarten program in, for Egypt for four and five-year-olds, ECEC post-secondary curriculum standards for Qatar, and early learning curriculum frameworks in PEI, Nova Scotia, and the Yukon. She recently led Manitoba's Early Learning and Child Care Commission focusing on system redesign in order to move towards universally accessible child care. And prior to her years of experience in consulting, Kathleen was the Senior Director for the PEI or Prince Edward Island Government from 1981 through to 2005 and served as Director of the PEI Children's Secretariat leading an integrated governmental strategy with seven government departments. Kathleen's currently a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Ontario Institute for Studies in Education in the Developmental Psychology and Education Program with a specialization in the early years. Although I hazard to say, it sounds like she might already have that accomplished. <laughs> she has authored numerous publications and presented at national and international conferences focused on children's issues and I am super pleased to welcome Kathleen today and I am invite her to share her screen with us. Okay, thank you, Karen. Hi, everybody. I think uh, we're good to go here now. Um, so first of all, thanks for the introduction, Karen, and thanks for the overview of your organization. That was really helpful for me also to hear that. Um, I thought before I get into really talking about the National System for Canada, that I would start with a, uh, let's get this, start with just a very short story. And I know that some of my childcare colleagues that are on this call will recognize the story, but basically it starts with somebody who is walking along a beach in Vancouver, uh, of Vancouver Island, and spots what really looks like a magic lamp in the sand and decides to go and pick it up. And as soon as he touches the lamp, a genie pops out and says, oh, I'm so happy that you picked up the lamp. You know, I've been here for years and, you know, waiting for somebody to come along so that I can grant a wish. So what would you like? Anything at all? And so the person said, well, I would love to see a bridge from Vancouver Island to Hawaii. And the genie said, well, that's outrageous. That's over 4,000 kilometers in uh, distance. You know, we don't have engineers who could even build that. And the environmental assessment and impacts would be so, so gigantic. You know, how would we begin that? And think about the jurisdictional issues. You're talking about two different countries. I, I can't do that. There must be something else that I can grant you for a wish. And the person thought and said, well, how about a national childcare system for Canada? And the genie thought about it for a moment and said, how many lanes would you like on that bridge? So that's kind of a, um, an introduction to the level of complexity for uh, what it might be like for um, Canada to develop a national system. Uh, I think you're all familiar, and that's probably why there's such interest today, in that the, recent, uh, the federal government has recently made some announcements talking about such a national system. So the 2020 speech from the throne and then the 2020 fall economic statement did both announce plans to work with province, provinces and territories to develop a national system for Canada. The government said that they're going to build on previous commitments. And so I think it would be useful to look back and see what kind of commitments have already been made and that they would learn from uh, some of the work that's been done in Quebec. So while there's not a lot of information on what this system might look like, we do know that the federal government has talked about subsidizing before and after school age costs for parents. And they have announced that they will commit to a specific amount of money for the ELCC workforce 
and that will be a one year commitment. And they've also announced some money for indigenous early learning childcare. And they're right now currently, and so are provinces and territories, wrapping up the renewal of bilateral agreements that are associated with the 2017 multilateral. The federal government has been very clear in saying that the upcoming budget in 2020, the 2021 budget will have more specific information on what they are thinking in terms of a national system. I'm just trying to make sure I know how to move these forward. Okay. So as uh, some of you probably know, this is not really the first time that a national system has either been recommended or has been considered by the federal government. So it was 50 years ago that the status of women made a recommendation that there needed to be a national system for Canada. And moving on through the years, there have been various task force and committees that have made similar recommendations. There have been different policy priorities outlined in different government documents, such as the Liberal Red Book through the 90s. There was the foundation program, or usually um, referred to as the quad principles back in 2005. So there's been lots of talk over many years about developing some kind of a national system for um, early learning and childcare in Canada. Now, of course, it's not a simple matter for the government of Canada to announce that they're going to create a national system when provinces and territories have the primary responsibility for designing and delivering those kinds of systems. This quote that is on your screen is a quote from the 2017 multilateral early learning and childcare framework. And it clearly states that every provincial and territorial government determines their own priorities when it comes to early learning and childcare. And I would expect that there would be similar language in any kind of a national childcare system or agreement for such a, a, a system. So having said that, there has been some influence from the federal government on how provinces and territories have moved forward in designing their systems. So this is one example. Back in the late 60s, early 70s, the federal government had a cost sharing plan with provinces and territories. It was called the Canada Assistance Plan. And this plan gave back 50 cents for every dollar that a province or territory would spend, typically focused on social service uh, support type programs. And so the criteria for subsidy fell under this cost sharing program. So subsidy was available uh, to help with the childcare costs for families who were in need or likely to be in need. There had to be social criteria and income testing that was uh, linked to provincial or territorial legislation regarding welfare assistance. So the regulations for welfare assistance- That's a waffle man. Also applied to. Um, oh yes, Kathy. What are you saying? Bad B. Okay, I'm just going to continue on. I'm not sure um, who the question is coming from. You're a schmuck. So, so um, provinces and territories realized that they could support uh, parents to pay for the cost of childcare but they didn't have a mechanism to be able to support the childcare system itself. And so the Canada Assistance Plan slowly branched out to cost share operating grants with provinces. That's my head life. I'll be out here living my best life. At first these Tell me what you said. You Okay, I think uh, I think you should be able to hear me now, although I need to go back. Sorry. Um, so the, the, uh, the overall approach of the Canada Assistance Plan was always that it had to focus on families in need or likely to be in need. And so 
it was not until the 1990s that the Canada Assistance Plan was ended and the federal government moved toward block funding provinces and territories. And the, there was the CHST, the Canada Health and Social Transfer, and the Canada Social Transfer. When, those, when that happened, Quebec was really the only province that moved beyond those Canada Assistance Plan guidelines or the way the program was structured. And so if you look across Canada today, and Alberta would be one province where this would be a good example, subsidy for families pretty well everywhere follows the same kind of criteria. There's social criteria and that parents need to be working or studying or having health issues uh, or looking for work. And once a, a family would meet that social criteria, then there's an income test, which, which might have different uh, parameters depending on the jurisdiction but it's the same format that was created back in the 1970s. So in many ways, a lot of what's happening in childcare across Canada has been influenced by some of the programs from 50 years ago. Now, that's not to say that there haven't been some examples of success where the federal government, provinces and territories have all come together on uh, various agreements. The, um, 1999 National Children's Agenda was an example of a, a collection of ministers. It was ministers responsible for social policy renewal who agreed on a national children's agenda setting out goals for children and youth in the country. And then a few years later, first ministers uh, agreed on an early childhood development initiative, which really narrowed down the focus of the national agenda to look at very, very young children. And then the 2003 multilateral framework agreement, again, narrowed that even further to look at the childcare issues for that young group of children. There were 2000 and 2005 agreements in principle, and that was on those quad principles I mentioned earlier. Those agreements were canceled with the change in government, but then by 2017, provinces and territories and the federal government did agree on a multilateral early learning and childcare framework agreement. And then each of the provinces and territories has an action plan that relates to that framework agreement and has their own bilateral agreement with the government of Canada for funding transfers. So there are some early indications as to what we could expect in a national system. We know that there'll be a focus on quality and affordability, access, flexibility, and inclusion, because those are the principles that are already outlined in the 2017 multilateral agreement. And there is no doubt that the plan will reflect PT priorities, PT meaning provincial territorial, because that is where the responsibility lies. The Federal government has already announced that their thinking is influenced by Quebec's model. And so we're gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes. And it very well could be a multi-pronged approach because even though provinces and territories have a responsibility for design and delivery of childcare, there are some other things that the federal government could do that are within their own realm of responsibilities. Unlike the 2017 multilateral agreement, we do know that the workforce will be a priority in the national system and that's been acknowledged by both the government of Canada and it has always been a priority of provinces and territories and from what I know at this point the Indigenous early learning and child care arrangements will be negotiated separately from the uh, provincial territorial agreement. So Quebec, so th there's been lots of talk about Quebec and what is the Quebec model and and why is that going to be so important in looking at a national system? So I'm just gonna talk quickly about Quebec because I think many of you probably do know the Quebec model. So going back to the 1990s, Quebec introduced one low fee for all children, regardless of the age of the child. So there was no infant rate or toddler rate. In 1997, that was at $5 a day, and now it's up to $8.50 a day. And that fee is reviewed every January 1st. So it's just last month that it was increased to $8.50 a day. And because they have such a, a demand for spaces and unmet need within the nonprofit Safe Air system, which is the low fee system, the government is now funding some of the private centers for that reduced fee. And there are some conditions that they place on that, but that's been a major development. 
Since 2009, again, in response to the um, large unmet demand for spaces, parents who were using the unfunded centers who were paying regular market prices, similar as to what somebody might pay in Edmonton, they are now able to get a tax credit, which depending on the family income might range anywhere up to 75%. So the thing about Quebec is though, there is no subsidy program for low income parents. Um, there is provision that if a family is in receipt of welfare assistance, then they are eligible for two and a half days a week of free childcare if they wish, but for Low income families who are not able to afford the 850 per day per child, they have no other recourse to any kind of uh, subsidy or financial assistance with the cost of that childcare. Um, and then the other thing is that for a while, Quebec moved toward a sliding scale and they were going, they did that through the income tax system. So that was in place for about five years, but has now been discontinued. The other important thing to remember about the Quebec model is that the low fee childcare policy was actually part of a much broader family policy um, and looking for women's equality and helping women to be able to participate in the labor market. Um, the funding in Quebec and the fund, this kind of funding goes to the nonprofit centers or the, the low fee centers or reduced fee centers, set fee centers, there are all kinds of terms that are used for that. So the nonprofit centers, the Centre de Petite Enfance, um, they are funded to allow wages to be paid to their staff according to a wage scale. And so the funding is sufficient to allow for that very low fee that parents contribute. And as I mentioned, some of that funding is now in place for some private centers. Since the Quebec government has opened up some of these options for, for private or for-profit centers, there has been a tenfold increase in the number of private centers uh, across the province. There's also a huge amount of Quebec spaces that are in family childcare, about 40%. And really that percentage used to be higher until there was uh, this increase in the number of private centers. So just doing the math, it's about 40% now. But family childcare providers in Quebec are unionized, which is another, that's a very unique um, piece of the Quebec system. What, one of the things that Quebec has done really well is uh, document, measure, and analyze the impacts of their low fee childcare system. And so there is a significant body of research to document the economic benefits. And so I'm sure that you've seen the reports from Quebec that the system virtually pays for itself because of the increased female labor force participation and the increased revenue to the province in terms of income tax and the lowering of uh, payments made for social assistance. There have been criticisms in Quebec about the quality of their centers because they had such rapid expansion. And so they are focusing now province-wide on an initiative to measure quality and look at outcomes for children. There's consistently been a very high demand for spaces. And just a few weeks ago, the Quebec government said that they had now have 51,000 and a bit parents on a wait list for a space across the province. But there are other models other than the Quebec model. So I'm going to give you an example from Prince Edward Island, where I live. Uh, PEI introduced a new model in 2010. And the government calls it a community-based, a publicly managed community-based kind of a system. Government determined on basis of population of children across the province where they wanted to be able to provide uh, childcare to, uh, so that it would be accessible to children in those areas of the province. And then they invited licensed centers to voluntarily apply for designation as an early year center. The earlier centers, very similar, identical to the Quebec model. There are set fees for children, although the fees are not as low as what they are in Quebec. And there is a wage scale. And there's quite a lot of additional quality criteria that's required. So for example, they must have parent advisory committees and they must provide full day year round services. They must participate in mentoring and coaching programs. But 
the funding allows, again, for, that, for those wages to be paid according to the wage scale and with those set fees for children, which are um, considerably lower than fees in other provinces, but yet you know, could be lower. And I say that as a PEI grandmother. Um, the, the model though allows for a mix of private or for-profit and nonprofit centers. The funding model controls for a profit margin. So the funding model actually ensures a 10% profit margin for all centers. And so it is a mix though when, when it comes to auspice. PEI manages the number of licenses that get issued, whether for the earlier centers designation or for any private centers. And they have introduced, uh, as is in place in Quebec and in Manitoba and in parts of Ontario, a centralized wait list in order to measure the demand, knowing that many parents have their names on multiple wait lists if you only look at center level. Um, <coughs> across the country, I find that there is a growing trend toward public management. And I'm not sure if you can see this part of the slide. I'm just gonna move this down a bit. And maybe I'll turn it so I can move that. So a growing trend toward public management. Um, there are set fees now in four provinces. In Newfoundland, they just introduced in January, in PEI, in Quebec, and in Manitoba. There's a pilot happening now in BC with $10 a day childcare. And you in Alberta have had a pilot, which I understand will conclude at the end of next month. Some other provinces have tried to manage how fees may increase in centers. So Nova Scotia does that. Uh, there's a set percentage that is allowed to be increased by the year. Some Ontario municipalities have tried to do that. There are two provinces now that have provincial wage scales. So in PEI, in the earlier centers, and in Quebec, in their nonprofit centers, and funding allows for those wages to be paid. Nova Scotia has taken a bit of a different approach. They've designed a wage floor so that no wages can be below a certain point, depending on a level of certification. And also something new across the country is this concept of designation. PEI introduced it in 2010 and New Brunswick introduced it about two years ago. And that seems to be a growing trend. How do you like designate centers and have higher quality requirements? And uh, again, there's more public management in those cases. And then some, some um, efforts to manage the number and the location of new centers. Now PEI does it through licensing but other provinces have tried to do it through their capital or startup funding. And so that would include uh, Manitoba, um, Nova Scotia, and I think British Columbia has done a little bit of that as well. Um, now, one of the other, there are a couple of other models that really need to be considered if you're thinking about how can a national system work for Canada. And so one has to do with family childcare. Now in Alberta, you have, uh, family childcare agencies, and so do uh, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Quebec, and Ontario. And in those four provinces, the agencies must be licensed. Whereas in the other provinces across Canada, each family home is licensed individually. Now you'll probably notice that Newfoundland is on both of those lists. And it's because in Newfoundland, somebody who wanted to be a family childcare provider has the option to become affiliated with an agency or to apply for an individual license. And of course, there's uh, quite a variation in terminology across the country as to terms used for family childcare. Now, school age childcare is another one to look at, especially because the federal government has already said that they would like to subsidize the fees for parents of school age children. So across the country, um, most provinces and territories define school age childcare for children usually up to and including 12 years old. There are a couple that stop at 10 years old. But school age childcare might be licensed or it might not be. In Quebec, it's not licensed at all. It's actually the responsibility of the Ministry of Education. So schools provide uh, school age childcare and all children have a right to that. So 
the Ministry of Families does not become involved at all in school age childcare. They focus on the preschool, the infants, toddlers, preschool age children in their childcare system. In Ontario, ever since the days of the introduction of full day kindergarten, schools are required to provide school age childcare. And either they do it themselves or through a third party contract. In some provinces, you don't need a license if it's operated by the school. Most provinces and territories do report that the majority of their school age childcare is actually delivered by community organizations like the Boys and Girls Club, or it might be a municipal recreation program. And so there were questions about what does that mean in terms of looking at school age childcare and parental subsidies. Um, this too, um, I have been told by people across the country, the school age childcare population has seen the largest drop in enrollment since the pandemic has started. So there are common elements across the country. There's quite a lot to work on in building a national system. There are legislation and regulatory frameworks in all jurisdictions, albeit 13 different ones. Everybody will either license the center or a home, um, even though they use some different terminology around that. And those regulatory frameworks are quite consistent in the kinds of things that they address, whether it's space or ratio, um, nutrition, administrative issues, all but one um, of the jurisdictions uh, do have staff qualifications in place. Uh, some have certification models, but there are no, there's no certification in New Brunswick, Quebec, uh, Northwest Territories, or in Nunavut. Um, even though they may have qualifications in place because of licensing. Some allow equivalencies. Um, I had one provincial uh, official say to me not long ago, well, you know, we have a national certification system for early childhood educators and I was puzzled. And she said, because we have the Canada Free Trade Agreement, which means that anybody who is certified in one of those provinces that does certify staff must be able to be certified anywhere else across the country. And the other thing that's common to, to Canada is the whole idea of early learning curriculum frameworks and yours is excellent in Alberta. And so across the country, everybody is at some stage in either implementing or piloting or maybe even in developing an, an early learning uh, curriculum framework. And there are differences. There are differences in auspice in, in how childcare is funded. Uh, there are differences by auspice in how childcare can be licensed. There are many, many different funding approaches. And there are even different approaches within um, areas where the goal might be the same. So when it comes to early childhood wages, sometimes there's a wage enhancement grant. Sometimes there's a wage scale or a wage grid. Newfoundland has an education supplement, which goes directly to the early childhood educator and is not done through the center at all. Across the country, data is quite weak. It's collected, but not generally analyzed. And part of the issue is that it's often collected and then housed in data systems that are many, many years old and not very friendly in terms of being able to pull that information off to be able to use anything. And across the country, there are many, many variations in both affordability and in access. So this uh, slide might be a little bit hard on your eyes, but um, I just want to say that the dotted line, the dotted horizontal line shows the provincial average in terms of the level of access that children have to licensed childcare. And this is for zero to five. The, then you can see that that varies quite a bit, even within a province or territory. The blue lines represent rural areas. And so across the country, children who live in rural areas have much less access to licensed childcare, while those in urban areas, which would be the gray, uh, the gray would be the highest urban area, those are generally way above the provincial uh, percentage of access for children. So I mentioned that there might be multi pronged approaches. And, and so, you know, one of the reasons I say that is because just recently, we've learned that Privy Council Office um, conducted a parent survey. It was a telephone survey and it was conducted in November, late November, early December of 2020. So just a few months ago. 
And the only reason that this was reported, and it was only reported about two weeks ago, is that Global News did a freedom of, a freedom of information request for the um, for news about the parent survey. <clears throat> so it was telephone survey. There were a thousand parents involved, and they asked parents about their opinions on different kinds of financial supports. One of them was asking people what they thought of a tax credit of five thousand dollars for use of full time childcare or should it be cash subsidies? They also asked, what are the barriers? And by far, people said that the high cost of childcare was a barrier. But there were also barriers noted in terms of waiting list or availability or even the quality of childcare. And those last three items, that comes within provincial jurisdiction. So you can see that, you know, bits and pieces, there are some um, information coming out as to what might be getting tested in, in terms of options for a national approach to childcare. And there is no doubt that childcare is expensive and many parents use four years of full-time childcare. So if you assume that somebody has 12 months of parental leave, then they pay childcare for one year at the infant rate, one at the toddler rate, and two years at the preschool rate for three and four-year-old children. So because you're all in Alberta, I took a look at the average fees in Edmonton and in Calgary for four years of childcare based on those different rates for the different age groups. And I also looked at the cost of four years of university tuition. And I did that for the University of Alberta and the University of Calgary. So keep it close to home for you. <clears throat> and you have to remember that for the university tuition, I also included those mandatory fees, which do give you access to the gym or sometimes, you know, dental or medical health coverage or you know some other kind of access to student counseling services and so on. And I added in the cost of books and materials because those are required fees. And the sad story to tell you is that the two um, lowest orange bars represent the university fees over four years with all those other perks of the books and materials and the gym membership and so on. The uh, four years of childcare in Edmonton was not quite as high as four years of uh, childcare in Calgary, but definitely four years of childcare is more expensive than four years of university. And it's usually at a time when parents are young and they probably have more than one child and they are at the beginning of their careers and they're probably paying their own student uh, loans at the same time. Now, I just want to finish off by taking a quick look at the municipal role, because I know there's been some municipal involvement in Alberta. It's quite even, uneven across Canada. In, mo in most places, there is no role at all for municipalities. Of course, it's quite heavy in Ontario. You have had experience in Alberta. In British Columbia, the city of Vancouver has done quite a bit in terms of supporting the development of childcare. So for example, developers, in order to get a building permit, they must show that construction will include space for a childcare center. New Brunswick is taking a little bit of a different approach and they're looking at school boards taking some role in the uh, management of childcare in their school board districts. That's in progress, it hasn't uh, happened yet, but uh, I think it's not too far off. Of course, Ontario's uh, involvement uh, on municipalities is legislated and it's got a long history. Um, some contribute more than others. Um, it has resulted in some approaches differing across the province so that subsidy criteria might be different in Guelph than it is in Ottawa. Some municipalities operate their own centers. So the city of Toronto has a, a large network of municipally operated childcare. In recent years, there are some municipalities that used to operate their own childcare centers and they have stopped doing so. There have been some efforts to reduce fees, um, which you know, in, in hindsight have now come back you know, with fee increases in some of those uh, municipalities. But legislation, curriculum, licensing, that uh, continues to remain as a provincial role. Interestingly, the Union of Quebec Municipalities has recently created a committee uh, to uh, be able to see how can they contribute to addressing the shortage of spaces in Quebec. So this is a quote from uh, 
that uh, union, that municipalities can play a strategic role in, in how to look at this file and meet the needs of families. These are some of the possibilities that the Quebec Union uh, put forward as to how municipalities could support childcare, either the creation of childcare, providing facilities for childcare, or even looking at some of their own municipal zoning laws, parking considerations, and so on in, in terms of supporting the childcare that does exist. So just finally is moving forward, um, and I know we're going to have some questions, so <clears throat> I'm looking forward to that. Um, I do believe that the complexity of the early learning and childcare system is often underestimated. When I was in government, I had a deputy minister and who said to me, I have two PhDs and I still have never seen the, a, a system as complicated as the childcare system. There are different pieces of legislation across the country. There are different models, different priorities, but there are also a lot of similarities. There are workforce shortages across the country and in the provinces where we do have some data, we can see that the majority of people that are hired are there to replace people who left, which limits the possibility for any expansion. So wages, benefits, working conditions, those are key issues, but they're not the only answer to the workforce shortage issue. It won't move forward without addressing those three items, but it won't be solved by only addressing those three items. And then finally, Canada is in the middle of planning for a national system while we are also in the midst of a global pandemic, which just only adds to the challenges. And so sometimes it feels just like this, trying to keep everything spinning. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Karen and some questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you could, uh, I want to first start off and give you a huge thank you, Kathleen, for your grace as we had um, an unexpected um, person within our talk today. So thank you so much for persevering through that. Um, and for everybody else for being patient, we did um, have that person exit. And that actually was something we didn't plan on. So we thought we'd planned on everything. So there you go. It goes to show, right? <laughs> so maybe Kathleen, if you can unshare your screen and then that will just put you and I up on the um, up on the screen. We've got lots of questions from folks and I'm going to do my very, very best to go through the sequence. Some of those questions, I don't know if you heard me as my um, body hit the floor when you did the comparison between childcare fees and university fees. That's... <laughs> that doesn't get any clearer than that. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go down through, Sunit's done a great job of capturing all of our questions. So there's some provincial related questions, of course, because we have people from lots of different places and your, your presentation covered um, the country and some of the models across it. Somebody was curious about the Quebec model when you made the reference to the switch from uh, five to 850 and you did mention seven in between. Somebody was just curious, were those changes incremental or was there a big change right off the bat? They were incremental. They've been growing since 1997. And so um, at times it was more of a political decision when they decided, you know, we can't afford this anymore. And so we need to increase those fees. Now it, it, it's in place that it will be reviewed every January 1st and adjusted accordingly. So it's definitely incremental. Perfect. Um, there's a few questions about the PEI model, which obviously, and that's your, your, your home territory. Um, somebody more curious about the, the model in general, but what are the additional quality criteria for the PEI model? Can you comment to those? Well, first of all, any earlier center must agree to not charge parents any more than the established fee that is, is established by the province, and they must um, pay wages according to the provincial wage scale. Earlier centers are also required to have many more certified people than would be required by regulation. They are required to provide full day childcare 12 months per year. They're required to provide meals during the day. Um, so they can't ask parents, you know, pack a lunch for your child. They are required to provide infant spaces. 
They have a zero reject policy for any child with any type of special needs. They are required to implement the PEI curriculum uh, framework. They are required to participate in the in PEI's mentoring and coaching program. They must participate in any research that is mandated by government. So any surveys, they're required to give their staff time to, to uh, participate in those surveys. They must have parent advisory committees in place. Um, so I may have skipped a few, but there's a long list of those criteria. I should say too in the PEI model that the fees that are established are matched to the maximum subsidy fee. So they will, in early year centers, there would never be a situation where somebody qualified for full subsidy, but yet the fee was higher at the center. And so the parent was required to pay that differential. That doesn't happen in the earlier centers. Okay. Um, you may have already touched on this, but someone asked about um, the auspice for PEI. So research has shown that auspice can affect quality. How is the profit control working in this regard within PEI? Well, there's a certain amount of money that gets that paid to each center. So the formula is that um, they will calculate the parent revenue, which they know what the fees are and they know the number of children in those age groups. So they calculate the parent revenue and they then calculate that wages. So they know the wages, they know how many staff are required and the, the wage grid um, would stipulate what the wage is based on the education and the job responsibilities of the staff person. So the total cost of wages is then calculated. Wages are considered to be 78% of the total cost of operating the center. So they look at the parent fees and they'll consider 90% of what you've collected in terms of parent fees and subtract the parent fees from what is calculated to be the total cost of operating the center and that's what the operating funding amounts to. So it will be different for each center, but it's fairly set formula. It's, you know, it's, it's not you know, pen and paper and adding all these things up. Um, I would have to say you know, that the model has been in place since 2010 and there has not been one earlier center, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit who has come forward to say, well, this just, you know, I can't survive with this kind of a formula. So. You know, I would take that as a good indication that it's working for people. There have been some private centers who have come forward to government to say, you know, this doesn't work for me. I have high mortgage payments. And the um, response from government has been, well, there's nothing wrong with the funding model, but it just doesn't fit your business model. And so Private centers are allowed to operate. They can set their own fees and pay their own wages. There's, and they do get some operating money, but it would not be as generous as the funding that goes to the earlier centers. Sounds good. Um, the next question, Minister Hussein's current mandate letter from Prime Minister Trudeau indicates that one of the objectives for the national childcare system is for the minister to work with provinces and territories to ensure that high quality care is affordable and accessible to all. Do you see this as requiring provinces to implement universal child care? Well, first of all, it would mean, I would ask, what do you mean by universal? Because universal doesn't necessarily mean free. Um, but if something would be, and even Quebec, I mean, Quebec is not free, but it's considered a universal program. So it's universally affordable. And when changes are made, it's for everybody. Um, so to implement a high quality and affordable, I, I believe that, well, I mean, we, we know what constitutes high quality. And, you know, the question then would be, are, will provinces be required to measure that quality and report on that? Some provinces do that, but many others have moved to a more continuous quality improvement approach so that there's continuous self-assessment at the center level involving parents and board members and staff and so on, rather than you know, a, a one-time measurement day. Like I know that, that those Eckers people are coming today. Um, so it's, you know, how do you approach the, the, uh, the efforts to improve quality? Is it through um, measurement or is it through a, a continuous process? And so, so a high quality 
I believe that the agreement will probably say that you've got to show that you are doing something to, you know, monitor that quality. And then affordable, you know, what might be affordable in Calgary is not going to be affordable in Nunavut. So, you know, that's where the PT priorities come in, the provincial territorial priorities, because it will be different in every part of Canada. What are some of the biggest issues with the early learning and care workforce that you've seen in PEI or any elsewhere in Canada? And what might those, how, sorry, how might those be addressed in the upcoming federal plan for a national system? Most of the um, research on human resources consistently identifies that early childhood educators and, and directors in, in center-based programs, and most of the research has been on center-based programs and not on family childcare, so I should qualify that, have very, very high levels of job satisfaction on some of the intrinsic pieces of their work. They believe their work is important. They value their relationship with children, with families, with each other. So. So all of those kinds of things get really high marks on job satisfaction. What doesn't get a high mark has to do with wages, benefits, working conditions. Is there a time for planning? Is there a time that I can actually sit down with other staff and we can, as a group, reflect on what, where the program is going? You know, the curriculum frameworks advocate for documentation, reflective practice, but do I have time to do that? So, people feel they don't have time to do what they know would constitute quality. The wages, um, you know, of course they vary across the country and, and each wage level means something different, you know, depending on the, the economies of the different provinces. Um, wages are low and people, when they leave, they say they're leaving because they're looking for something, some, still something to do to work with children. They don't wanna lose their profession but they can't do it in these kinds of settings. Benefits are almost non-existent and how that will be addressed, you know, again, you know, provinces and territories will need to look at their own systems. PEI, no, they found that most people who, the people who were coming into the sector, most of them were there to replace people who left. So there was very little room to be able to expand. So in the past, um, year, two years, since March of 2019, that wage grid for early childhood educators in PEI, the wages increased by 26%, and it will go up again in September of 2021. So people know that early childhood educators can be qualified to work in many other jobs of working with children, and there's a draw. And so people come and they leave. So that's, that's you need... You never, you can't have a recruitment strategy unless you also have a retention strategy because you're just recruiting for other occupations. Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked a question. This one came in when you were describing, I think your zero reject policy that you were talking about. Somebody was saying, asking, is it required for workers to obtain an anti-ableist or anti-disabledist education as part of that? Can you repeat that? Uh, you kind of blocked off. Is there a zero, if there is a zero reject policy, is it required for workers to obtain an anti-ableist or anti-disabledist and education? Um, that terminology is definitely not used on the East Coast. So, but I think you're maybe asking whether people who may be hired as additional staff for children with a, a range of uh, disabilities whether they require specialized training in, in terms of what they're doing. So um, the, the short answer is no, there's nothing in regulation on that. Um, however, in the earlier centers, staff are required to have hold some level of certification. So it's, it's um, kind of a circular um, a piece, I suppose. The revised regulations have um, just announced for a level of certification for inclusion support. But it, although it's in the regulation, they have not enacted that piece of it yet. Um, so whether it's a specific, well, that calls for an early childhood education or um, a human services diploma. 
and that that's the terminology that's used here so sounds good is it realistic for canada to reduce the child care fees in future as it as is the case in other countries like germany where child care costs are only about two hundred dollars a month well if germany can do it why can't canada do it I mean, it, you know, <laughs> if, if that is your goal, then, then you would figure out how to do that. Are factors of accessibility beyond cost taken into account for programs like this? For example, for more flexible opening hours or drop-in childcare? I think that's gonna be one of the biggest challenges in terms of introducing the national system because the Monday to Friday, you know, seven to six, you know, or whatever the hours may be, does not necessarily work for everybody. And in fact, in some provinces, particularly in urban areas, the only childcare that's available is a full-time space. And so even parents who are employed part-time, they must take that full-time space or they don't get anything at all. So it doesn't really accommodate parents who have non-traditional work hours for whatever reason it might be. And that I think is going to be the biggest challenge. Um, you know, will that be a licensed kind of a system for those non-traditional workers? Will it be a tax credit um, similar to the way Quebec gives a tax credit to people who are somewhat outside of their funded system? That I think is, is one of the biggest challenges in terms of creating a national system. I think a system can be created, whether it's going to be applicable and relevant to every person who is employed who needs childcare is quite another story. In your mind, which reasons for getting involved in early learning and care in some way seem to be the most appealing at the municipal level for elected officials? Well, I think municipalities are closer to their families than anybody in a provincial government office. And they know the, the kinds of peripheral issues. You know, I, I was interested in the Quebec um, Union of uh, Municipalities who identified things like a safe way to walk from the center to a park as one of the things that the municipality could help with. There's nothing in any provincial or territorial legislation across the country that even considers how do you get to the park and is it safe to go? What about parking? You know, can there be parking spaces designated for parents who need to drop their children off? You know, that's a local issue. And, you know, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's a blend, there's a room for a blend of areas of involvement. And certainly I think that the municipalities um, are in probably the best position to be able to do that in many provinces. You know, uh, it, in some provinces, you know, there are very few municipalities. It just, you know, it, it wouldn't be relevant. But in places like Alberta and Ontario and, you know, British Columbia with like large urban populations. And I think, yes, the municipality is best suited to, to take, to become involved. Thank you, Kathleen. Well, I'm gonna draw us to a close to respect everybody's time. Um, Incredible, incredible conversation, incredible presentation. Um, and our chat box is just full um, of really great conversation. So thank you so much, Kathleen, for helping us your, for your mm -hmm. insights today. Again, for your grace in dealing with a particular uh, participant we didn't necessarily want. I want to remind everybody that our local partnership talk is going to play, take place in two weeks time on March the 10th and will be led by Dr. Rob Bushman, our policy research associate in CUP and the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care. They're gonna follow up with a more local perspective of the issues and the strengths and assets and even recommendations for an integrated system of early learning and care in Edmonton. We'll be sending out a brief thank you to everybody and a survey to follow up. Please do provide us with your feedback. We really, really, really would appreciate it. It helps us improve what we're doing. Uh, Sinead's gonna put the link in the chat box, but we'll also send it to you through Eventbrite. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kathleen, so much. And we look forward to seeing everybody on March the 10th. Be well, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you.